Hi, viewing audience. I'm Tom Romito, a board member for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. And I'm sitting here with Randy Mitchell, who is the director of the field station at Bath Nature Preserve. We're at Bath Nature Preserve, which is uh, in Summit County, uh, just south of uh, Cuyahoga County. And Randy, it's, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you about the subject you're going to talk about to the Audubon Society uh, in February. Um, what I'm mainly interested in right now is uh, your role uh, here at the Nature Preserve. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, we have a cooperative agreement between the University of Akron and uh, the, uh, the town, Bath Township to uh, work here at the Bath Nature Preserve, which they have preserved from what used to be the old Firestone Estate. They voted a levy on themselves to uh, preserve this area because it has some really interesting and useful habitats. And I guess you guys have been noticing that, that uh, birders have found this to be a really interesting place. We, we get uh, uh, good populations of bobolinks and, and uh, a fair number of the grassland birds, the henslows and grasshopper sparrows. And, uh, some sh a shrike likes to be around here. We've got a pair of eagles that have moved in in the last few years. So it's, it's a good birding habitat. And uh, so our work with, uh, with Bath is to help them uh, understand what they have and how to manage it. And uh, in return, we get to come out here and take students who oftentimes have never been out, uh, out in, in actual wildish areas uh, like this. So it's a great opportunity for our students. Well, thank you, Randy. Could, could you tell me specifically what is the mission of the field station? Uh, it's to, to uh, preserve the land and to help people know more about it and to help learn more about it. And what specific studies do you do? Uh, I, I mostly do work with uh, pollinators and their conservation and biology. I've also found since uh, the university has come into possession of some wetland properties, I've started to teach myself about wetland ecology, but I'm a bit of a novice on that. Then let's talk a little bit more about plant pollinator conservation. Can you give us an overview uh, about that body of knowledge. Yeah, so uh, uh, pollinators are really important because without them a lot of plants couldn't uh, uh, reproduce themselves and then we'd all be at a loss since everybody eventually is, is eating plants or you're eating something to eat a plant. So we've, um, I've been trying to understand how the pollinators affect the plants and how the plants affect the pollinators and we do that using all kinds of techniques from, from uh, binoculars to, and muddy boots to uh, DNA and, and lab work and, uh, and uh, fluorescent microscopy and things like that. Just we, we try to understand as much as we can about what the plants are gaining from it and what they're providing to the pollinators and what the pollinators are providing to the plants and, uh, and how that's, that all uh, averages out. It's not always a mutualistic relationship. There are cheating uh, insects. Some insects will, uh, will not pollinate, but they'll still take the food. Uh, carpenter bees are a great example. They'll sneak down and, mm -hmm. and cut holes in flowers. And so... Uh, we, we, gotta kind of, we kind of keep score on, on who's be doing good things and who's doing bad things. I see. Well, thanks, Randy. Now, the Audubon community knows that you're going to come talk to us about uh, management and conservation of bumblebees. Can you tell us how you, you made that narrow focus from your overall interest in pollinator conservation? Because bumblebees are the best bees there are. <laughs> I love them. They're really cool. They, uh, they are big and fuzzy, and e for scientists, they're easy to watch. They're, they're big enough that you can follow them and see what they're doing. A lot of the very important bees are, are the size of the words, a word on a, scent in a, on a printed page. They're, they're small, and once they leave the flower, you don't know where they've gone. But if I want to know how the bees are moving and causing the plants to mate with one another, I, I need to be able to follow them. So th uh, there's a, a sort of a practical reason that, that I like to study them, but mostly because they're just fuzzy and cool. Can you give me a brief overview of what you'll tell the audience uh, in, on the, at the February meeting? Sure. I, th I thought it would be a good idea to talk about bumblebees uh, and, and their status in the Great Lakes. Uh, we've got a number of, uh, uh, had a lot of changes in the last dozen years in bumblebees. The, uh, we have some species that are now proposed for going on the endangered list that, are, uh, that once occurred in Ohio. And as far as we know, uh, one of them... Some of the last sightings were, were just uh, three or four miles from here by my students in Furnace Run. And uh, a few, few spottings, uh, that would have been about 98 or 99. And then in around 2005, there were a couple seen in Massillon of this one species, the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. And they may have found one up in Toledo uh, two years ago. But before that, it was the, one of the most common bees you'd ever find. 
uh, it, it, uh, it's just disappearing. We're not completely sure why. Mm -hmm. And I thought the more I can let people know about them and, and, and bumblebees in general so we can do things that help them, the better off they're going to be. Well, thanks, Randy. I'd like to bring our conversation back to a larger focus, and, and that is the potential impact of climate change on plant pollinators. Can you discuss that a little bit? Uh, yeah, it's uh, climate change. Uh, change is a good word because it, it doesn't always mean hotter, doesn't always mean uh, drier, but it can mean those things. And uh, the the work that's been done on pollinators shows that that uh, climate change is gonna is going to have idiosyncratic effects. It's going to change some uh, the situation for some bees, but not for others. Um, it it will change the time the relative timing of the plants and the pollinators because the, the plants are often cued in uh, to uh, to photo periods, and the bees are often cued into temperatures. And so if the temperature changes, but the photo periods aren't changing, we're going to have a mismatch about when the bees are around and when the plants that, that they need for their food and that need the bees for pollination are going to be around. Um, with bumblebees, we've also found uh, the evidence so far shows that that um, they're, not, they're not tracking as, as, as the pro appropriate temperature for the temperatures for them to move north. Uh, they're, they're not able to track it. They, they aren't uh, moving north at, uh, at the southern end of their boundary as well as they could, and they're getting left behind. And, and that means uh, that there's smaller populations and that they're more in danger of extinction. Can you discuss this a little bit at the February meeting? That's one of the main pieces I want to talk about. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen of the beauty audience, uh, I hope to find many of you coming to our meeting in February at the Rocky River Nature Center. We'd love to see you there and learn more about this important topic. Thanks very much for watching.